Uh, he hello, everyone. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ali Mohammadi. Uh, he's currently working uh, at Institute for Research in Fundamental Science in Iran. And today he's going to talk about almost orthogonal subset uh, of vector space of finite fields. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Thank for the introduction. And um, also thanks for having me as a speaker. It's a great pleasure to talk here. Um, so as Thang said, I'll talk about almost orthogonal subsets of vector spaces over finite fields. It's a joint work with um, Georgis Petridis. And uh, we start with a motivation that was a question of Erdős, uh, which is what is the maximum number of subsets S1 to Sm of, uh, of the N element set so that the intersection of all these distinct sets um, have um, even in, even cardinality, so it's um, zero or two. And just a small point here that um, you probably have heard of the even town um, odd town problem. So uh, the even town as um, so you have a town of n people, and you want to ask. Um, what's the maximum number of clubs you can make with these people so that the intersection between these clubs is even, but with the extra restriction that each club has exactly um, an even number of people as well. Then there is the odd town problem, exactly the same, except that he asks that the clubs are odd. Um, so again, even intersection. And um, a small point here is that here, the question of Erdős, I think he also included the empty set. And again, if, if you have heard of these two problems, you, you probably know that the answer changes just dramatically. If, um, for the odd town problem, the answer is um, m has to be less than n. For the even town, it can be uh, two to the n on two. But this question with no restriction, um, Beryl Camp in 1969, gave this upper bound um, for M and it's actually tight. And um, again, for this part of the talk, because this was the original phrasing, um, here you're allowing the empty set, but actually when we move on, we won't allow it. So maybe keep that in mind. And also for now, just um, keep in mind this N on two. Okay, one observation that uh, Bell Camp used was that if you have a set T in one to N, you can define a vector um, associated to that set we want to be N, where it's um, VI, each VI is defined as such. So it's one if I is in T. And I mean, to make it clear with an example, V of one, three, four is, um, you know, has a one for each spot of these elements of one, zero, um, for three, one. Or also the one. And um, the observation is that the intersection of these, uh, if you have two sets T1 and T2, the, uh, the intersection becomes congruent to the dot product of these vectors, mod two. And so the question of Erdős can be rephrased as what's the maximum um, size of a subset of um, F, this vector space F2 to the N with that actually yeah, here. So Original question of Erdős allowed zero, but we won't anymore. Such that um, for every distinct two elements of S, you have the dot product being zero. You can try to extend it to FQ now. So instead of two, take it to Q, uh, Q being a uh, prime power. And for this, um, we define, I mean, you don't have to, you can just go with dot product, but. Uh, People have considered the gen more general form and they have defined this by, by linear forms over vector spaces and it's defined as such. It's, um, it's a mapping that's linear in both variables. It's uh, it defined by uh, matrix and n by n matrix over FQ. And we call it symmetric if A is symmetric, we call it degenerate if determinant of A is zero. So I mean symmetric as in X and Y can be switch. And we say two bilinear forms are equivalent if the matrix is equivalent in that, uh, meaning that there is some invertible P so that A2 um, associated to B2 
is uh, equal to transpose of p times a1 times p, um, a1 being um, the matrix is equal to b1. Technically, it just says that um, if, you know, to, to up to some um, change of basis, these two bilinear forms are the same thing. And there is a characterization. I just want to go over it, don't take it too seriously. Um, because it just says that every uh, symmetric non degenerate bilinear form becomes one of two things. So for odd Q, fix some non square elements in FQ, write eta for the quadratic character. Um, we have added zero to it. So eta of zero is zero, and eta of A is one if uh, A is a square and eta of A is minus one of it. And for any bilinear form, we define an epsilon b inside zero, one, and four um, gamma, so that um, gamma being the uh, non square element, so that this thing holds. So, I mean, um, say if n is six, uh, this inside and a is the identity, so if a is the identity matrix, uh, then you have the dot product. Um, and if um, n is six, you have the minus one here. And then it's just a question of what, what this epsilon is gonna be is a question of whether minus one is a square in the field or not, which is a question of, again, if um, p is um, one mod four or uh, three mod four. And the theorem that we took out of a um, algebra textbook is that every, Symmetric non degenerate bilinear form over FQ, Q odd is one of these two things. The main point I want you to keep in mind is that is this alternating plus and minuses. Um, for the rest of the talk, we're just going to keep epsilon b being one just for simplicity, but everything you'll see has been treated more generally. And, but yeah, these plus minuses are really, I mean, Convenient because you can see the existence of self um, orthogonal vectors in the field. Then we come to the definition of orthogonal sets. Like I said, we fix epsilon b to be one. Uh, we say a subset of uh, our vector space is orthogonal if for every distinct two tuples, um, the, the, the bilinear form is zero. Um, we define a node of Qn to be the largest orthogonal subset of Qn. And we say a subspace of Qn is orthogonal, is an orthogonal subspace. If you take zero out of it, then you get a orthogonal set. Um, again, remember we are taking out zero. So um, Ahmadi and Mohammedian uh, proved in 2016, the exact size of orthogonal sets. Again, they did it for all non-degenerate symmetric bilinear forms here. We just stick with the ones that have epsilon b for one. And um, again, you can see the resemblance to what Beryl can had uh, for Q being two. And this was actually be initiated by Wien. Um, Wien got the dimensions right, but I think he got the exact, he, he overestimated the exact size by a little. For lower bound, it's easy if n is odd, um, take, because of, if you remember the alternating signs plus minuses, x1, x1, x2, x2, xn, xn, and a zero at the end, um, and then also at the one that has one and zero all the way. And this is an orthogonal set because every two elements out of it, you can easily see that uh, all of them. And the size is exactly what we had in the last uh, previous slide. And for even similarly, um, it just fits very tightly. Um, and again, what we had in the previous slide. A key structural lemma that uh, Ahmadi and Mohammed used, which is actually very similar to uh, what Beryl Camp had, is if S is an orthogonal set, and here we're not restricting Q to be odd, then there exists an orthogonal subspace and a set of non self orthogonal vectors so that you can uh, sit s tightly into the uniform into the union of v and t so v is the orthogonal subspace t is the non 
self-orthogonal bit sub s. And this is really crucial here, that two dimension of b plus size of t is less than or equal to one. A rough idea of the proof is that uh, you take b to inside s to be a basis of the subspace formed by s, take b prime to be the self-orthogonal bits of b, take b double prime to be the um, non-self-orthogonal bits. Then they show that you can take v to be the span of b prime, the self-orthogonal bits, which is clearly an orthogonal subspace, and t to be uh, the remainder. So the non, non self moments. And uh, I mean, it's not hard to show, um, but too long to show here. And the proof makes crucial use of the fact that V is a subset of uh, orthogonal complement of V by definition of V, which is that it's self orthogonal. And also the rank nullity theorem that dimension of um, a span of S plus dimension of uh, orthogonal complement of S is N. So say if T was empty, then it's easy to see. But T non big not being empty. Um, as in, because if T is empty, then S is all of B. And, um, so two dimensional B is less than. Again, uh, we come back to the theorem. Rough idea was we know this um, characterization of orthogonal sets. So if you let K to be the dimension of V, which S sits tightly in, you can see that K is less than um, floor of N on two. And then um, just playing with this inequality, you see that S is less than Q to the K because of this V and N minus two K because of this T and N minus one because you have to take that zero. And because Q is larger than three, this becomes maximized if K is maximum. And so if N is even, you get this thing, and if n is odd, uh, you get n minus one on two, and you put it here and do this. And so now we move on to the almost orthogonal sets. Um, before we had every two distinct elements being orthogonal, pair was orthogonal. Here we asked that out of every k, l of them or pair was orthogonal. The question now becomes what is the largest such subset of the QM? Over the Euclidean setting, Rosenfeld in 1991 proved that three two orthogonal subset of Rn are size two n. And so, I mean, the intuition here is that a three two orthogonal set is the union of two orthogonal sets. And this is, um, I mean, the intuition holds over any field. And orthogonal sets are trivially of size n over R. So, I mean, it was, a, it was actually a question of Erdrich that it should be to and Rosenfeld proved it. And uh, I mean, more recently that proved that same holds over CN, but you have to only look at uh, sets that don't have self-orthogonal vectors. Because if you have a self-orthogonal vector, then you have an infinite span of it, uh, which is um, an orthogonal set. And so based on this intuition that the three, two set should be the union of two orthogonal, I mean, the point being that if you take three, two have to be in one and two, then those two would be orthogonal together. And so based on this, Ahmadi and Mohammedian made this conjecture, which is actually looks a bit weird. This is less than the union of two. And because the construction they gave had actually a line in the intersection. And what we proved with Georgis was um, that you can, these are actually a bit larger. So for odd, it's larger just for, by one, but for even, a bit more. And they proved an almost theorem, which actually appeared as a theorem, but we actually found a hole in it, um, was that for odd Q, you can have three Q to the floor of N on two. Um, the whole was that this was an inductive proof. And at some point um, they did a decomposition of uh, or the original set. And one of the bits lied inside uh, N minus two dimensional uh, subspace. And they used this inductive hypothesis on that part of the set to say that, okay, this is of size three to the Q to the N on two minus one, but um, the problem was that when you do go 
lower dimensions, you actually can't assume that your bilinear form stays non degenerate. And uh, the fix was not a big problem, but not trivial, trivial either. And in line with the even town problem, they made a conjecture. This is exactly the same as before, but characteristic too, as in Q being two. That if F is a family of non empty subsets of one to N, um, and with the property that among any three um, sets in F, there is a pair whose intersection is even, then you have something like this. And we proved that, um, again, for even, we matched it, but for odd, we proved that it's larger than one. But our, our proof was actually, I should say, the, the proof that I said Ahmadi and Mohammed gave that had a whole was first of all was fixable. Secondly, um, we actually showed that that same idea gives a proof for the whole conjecture. And um, again, it, this this was an inductive proof based on the, that argument. I'm not going to talk about that argument in this talk because it's so long. But um, I should mention it. For K two orthogonal sets, we gave a um, asymptotic bound. So SK2 being K2 orthogonal, as in every K you take a pair is mutually orthogonal. And we get, we get this Q to the N on two, and this is expected. So if you K put K to be three, you get the two plus the over one times Q to the N on two. Um, and it's again, not hard to see that why this should be just about sharp, but only when N is even, when N is odd or when your bilinear form is different. And um, I don't think this idea works here. The idea was by counting the double counting the number of uh, two tuples uh, that are orthogonal, you actually can give a character some upper bound for it. This is the expectation. Um, the character sum actually is a sum over all characters of the double sum of inner you know, brother, which we'll see in a few slides down. And this is the error term. So this gives you the upper bound and for the lower bounds, the observation here is that if you look at, if you make a graph uh, with vertices coming out of S and with the, um, with the property that it has an edge if um, the two are not mutually orthogonal, then um, the K2 orthogonality tells you that it's KK3, as in complete graphs of um, vertices, vertex set size. K, um, because you know one pair has to be orthogonal, and so this gives you uh, an upper bound on the number of edges for this graph. But we, we actually want the number of edges which are orthogonal. So it's S choose two minus this. So you get a upper bound for this O of F, O of S. Um, I mean, this should be twice the number of these edges. But I mean, just a rough idea is this. And we didn't use any structural theorems. And this is pretty, pretty bad way of estimating things. For example, we are not talking about self-orthogonal vectors or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 yeah, the whole project actually started with this. And the idea was that, okay, if this works on average of characters, let's just look at one character. And I mean, I, I'll talk about it in a few slides. The lower bounds uh, for n being odd is the union of two self-orthogonal sets, sorry, uh, two orthogonal sets. So as in any two you take out of this are mutually orthogonal. We saw this before. Any two out of this you take are orthogonal. But what's funny about it is that unlike Euclidean setting, you actually can add an extra vector. So you get actually one more than um, union of two disjoint orthogonal sets. These are both maximal orthogonal sets. And the construction actually took us a long time to um, get. And especially because it was an inductive proof we needed to find out what we need. Um, for even and even again, this. And this goes, X, uh, the second one is the same thing, except it goes alternatively, X1 minus X1, X2 minus X2. What was funny was the construction that Ahmadiyya and Mohammedian gave, uh, which if you remember, they, um, 
underestimated by a factor of two was that they shifted. So they took this, they shifted by one element to the right. And ultimately you had an intersection between these two of size Q. But the idea here was to um, do this um, alternating plus minus signs. So these two are again, um, maximal orthogonal sets. Each is of size Q to the M minus one. So you have two of them. And uh, you get this thing, which is what we proved. So um, I want to talk about the character sum proof we gave. Um, so the, the paper is dominated by an inductive proof, which actually treats all bilinear forms and um, all odd and even ends. But this seems to only work for when epsilon b is 1 and as in just half of the bilinear forms and also when n is even. Um, so a character is on an abelian group is um, a group on homomorphism from G to the unit circle. Crucially, we have this, um, this identity that um, for a non, if, if chi is non-trivial on H, um, then um, you get, uh, the whole size of H and if it's, um, um, otherwise you get, if, sorry, if it's trivial on H, you get all of H and if it's non-trivial, you get zero. So full cancellation. And we want to go to the characters of FP, which is uh, isomorphic to ZP and the, the characters are just e to the two pi i X on P. And it's well known that uh, um, you get all of the characters of FP in this way, as in, EP of AX as A runs through FP. The point being that now you can extend this to FQ through the trace function, which is a linear mapping um, from FQ to FP. And um, so as in, I'm just showing you a hierarchy of how the character is built. Uh, so you define this psi of X as the EP of trace of X. And again, psi of AX is uh, as A runs through FQ, depends, represents all of the characters of FQ. And now crucially, if you have a subspace of FQ to the N and S is not in the orthogonal complement of V, uh, then, and B remember is a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form, then psi of P of um, SX is, a non is non-trivial on V. Um, and we have this, um, if, if this was just EP, this would have been due to Vinogradov, but really this is the same proof. This inequality is pretty well known, and especially because the uh, crowd here is a bit combinatorial, I'm not really, I'm not showing the proof. So if um, B is a symmetric non-degenerate by the new form, you have this um, non-trivial cancellation. And the trivial bound here being just, um, size of X times size of Y. And um, it's also a good time to point out that this gives the Q to the N on two. And this kind of, the whole reason that I said it only works for even N uh, for this problem is really just this. Um, because, I mean, you'll see later on because we actually want N minus one on two. Um, for for example, when n is odd, this doesn't differentiate between the two. But I think it's fixable, but the fix would probably be uh, very difficult. So there is a structural lemma concerning uh, subsets of three two sets, which we make crucial use of, is that for any element of S, define S of subscript S subscript um, small s, the elements of S minus S. Um, so that these are not orthogonal to S. And then the result is that S, this set sits tightly inside some orthogonal subspace plus some set of, plus some remainder which are non-orthogonal, non-self-orthogonal. And um, Crucially, again, if you remember that a structural lemma about um, orthogonal sets, we had exactly this. So you can sort of see that we want to show that these S's are orthogonal. 
the assertion is trivial if this S is less than one, if, you know, if the, the single element is self-orthogonal put in V, if it's non-self-orthogonal put in T, and this is true. Um, if it's greater than or equal to two, be sure it's, orth it's an orthogonal set. The point being that take two elements out of this set S, the three to orthogonality of the superset S tells you that X1, X2, S, and S, one of these two uh, appear in these three have to be orthogonal. By definition of this set, it's not gonna be X1, S, or X2, S, because these are elements which are not orthogonal to S. So it must be that X1, X2 are orthogonal. So, I mean, that's it. It shows that um, this S subscript S is an orthogonal set. And then we use the previous structural lemma of amadium amadium to show that this sits tightly inside um, union of an orthogonal subspace and some remainder, which are um, non-self-orthogonal elements. We go to the proof. Um, let S be a tree to orthogonal set, add zero to it for convenience for now. Remember this definition. Um, we just make a tiny change to this definition of SS by, because here you um, didn't allow S to be in it, but here you do. So the difference could potentially be just a single element, just S itself. Let D be um, non-self-orthogonal elements of S. And this is a pretty uh, straightforward identity, um, again, because um, potentially in this prime set, we are not counting S itself, which may or may not be self-orthogonal. So you add D here. Um, this is just for convenience, but here it's obvious that. And the point being here that um, let's start from the bottom. As you take S1 inside S and S2 inside the complement of S, um, as in S minus this set, these are all S2s to which S1 is orthogonal. So this is just this. This, as in this side is always one because the inside is always zero. So this is just this and by this identity, this is just uh, this thing. But the point is that now we can work with this uh, double exponential sum. By triangle inequality, just look at this, um, the inner sum, we split it by, as in S minus this thing. So by triangle inequality, we split the inner sum. Then this S prime is pretty inconvenient. We go back to the non-prime definition and add the T, add the, uh, size D here. Um, and I mean, this is, this is all just triangle inequality. But the point being that here, we can now apply you know, Grotto's band on double sums. So this is this, and these two are just repeated. Um, I mean, I pause just a few seconds so that um, it sinks in. So I mean, just, just triangle inequality and you know, Grotto. Then this tells us that uh, going back to the two slides ago, this tells you that S2, just rearranging everything, is at most this thing. So we have now this double sum. It's a good time to stop here and see that um, if we bounded this trivially, it would be just as same as this. Now, each of these SSs are orthogonal sets, which Ahmadiyya and Mohamedia had bounded as Q to the N on two. So this gives you essentially S is less than three times Q to the N on two which is what they had, they wanted to prove. But the point is you have massive cancellation here. So the reason is that each of these SSs are sitting tightly inside some subspace, orthogonal subspace. So that two dimension of the S plus T, S is less than the point. So this uh, double sum, because it sits inside such a um, union, we, trivially split it again, this inner sum as such. Vs1 union Ts1, um, and then minus the complement, the 
rest. Okay. Again, this one, the first one that is um, sitting inside uh, the union of the subspace and some um, set of non self orthogonal vectors, we split the inner sum again. But the point is, is that this gives you complete cancellation. Remember, S1, as in uh, Vs1 is um, the span of elements which are not orthogonal to S1. So this tells us that this, for a fixed S1, this is actually a non trivial character. So this gives you complete cancellation. So this is zero, and we bound this one trivially. These Ts are the non self orthogonal vectors. So this just gets bounded trivially as this. And we had a um, difference as well. Sorry, I'm a few seconds, I think, over time here. Just about to finish. Um, and this just gets bounded trivially by Vs plus Ts minus Ss. Adding it all up, S to the two is, uh, we had this, so we, had, we wanted to bound this double sum. This just becomes uh, this, we had a minus sum of, um, S over SSs, they get canceled out completely. So we have um, the size of these um, orthogonal subspaces plus um, this remainder. And we use the fact that um, we use this inequality we had by the structural lemma of Ahmadiyya Mahamadiyan. And so for each S, this thing inside gets bounded by Q to the K to the S, K to the S being the dimension of V uh, plus two N minus four K to the S. And this is largest when KS is uh, um, largest, which is roughly N on two, which gives you the Q to the N on two. So adding it all up, you get what you wanted plus some small error term, um, which are the not self orthogonal vectors of S. and in the paper, we show with a lot of pain. Um, I mean, this part is not painful. So this is the ultimate inequality we get. And this alone just gives you S is less than two to the Q to the N on two plus one, um, because this can be two and then minus one. Um, but we show in the paper that this D is way too small compared to S, so this is actually zero. So you get, just one of the conjecture, um, but it's actually three pages long to show that this minus one can be made into a minus two. Um, I mean, I've skipped those details. Here. So with that, many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. So uh, question for speaker, please. I have uh, two short questions. Hi, Ali. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you could repeat why this works for Q odd only and for Q even. Um, oh, it's. I mean, you could actually. You mean the character sum uh, proof, right? Yeah, or the results were stated only for odd Q. So I'm guessing there's a reason probably why why Q oh, even. So I mean, so first of all, it actually, what Ahmadiyya Mahamadiyan did for um, orthogonal sets is actually exact, pretty much exactly the same as the one for even, so it does work. But for um, when you, sorry, I, when you tried this character sum proof um, for even characteristic, I think something goes wrong with this um, use of, um, sorry, with this use of Vinogradov's bounds. This ends up being a bit, a, a factor of two larger than what you want. I mean, it's explained um, in the paper. I mean, it, it's actually a long, um, long explanation. These, SSs here that we define, these are size less than Q to the N on two. Um, but these actually end for characteristic two, these actually end up being two to the N on two minus one. 
And if you run this whole argument, um, you get something um, as in, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really the Vinogradov bit that goes wrong. I, mean, um, mm -hmm. it just so I guess maybe my, my second short question is also related to the Vinogradov bit then, because instead of considering symmetric bilinear forms, you could as well uh, consider reflexive bilinear forms, I guess, right? If you just want the notion of orthogonality. But maybe then also the analog of Vinogradov is unknown or doesn't work, or do you have any idea about that? Um, I think, yeah, um, what, what is the definition of reflexive? So the reflexive means if the bilinear form uh, evaluated That's on x and y gives an zero, then also on y on x gives zero. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is already enough to give you certain yeah, geometrical I think work, yeah. Um, oh, okay. I'm not sure where it's because yeah, I remember actually previously when I had this Vinogradov, I hadn't put symmetric in it. Um, I think it probably does work. But um, okay. just quickly going back to your question, um, this proof that I gave, it actually works for all bilinear forms um, as in non-degenerate ones. And it actually works for all characteristics. And it actually mm -hmm. um, works for all in and odd and even. It's just that it just somehow magically ended up giving the answer for when n is even and epsilon b is one. Um, in other cases, it ends up overestimating by a lot. Um, and I, I just couldn't find out how to make it work for all these other scenarios. So I mean, short answer is that. Um, mm -hmm. And when I did try to make it work for all these other scenarios, it actually almost felt like you have to give an alternative like 70, 80% of the alternative proof, then come back just to use this Vinogrado thing. And mm -hmm. um, it, it just looked so ugly that in the paper, we just did this. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, so if uh, we don't have any more questions, so let's thank speaker again. Thank you very much.